Добрый день. Good, good afternoon. My name is Grigory Maltsev, uh, and uh, welcome to our session Active Design Maintaining a Healthy Lifestyle in the Mega City. The urban health approach links the risk factors uh, in urban environment and uh, the dwellers' health. And this approach encourages the creation of an environment that will meet the principles of sustainable development and promote uh, physical activity among citizens. Uh, there are different problems related to um, climate or environment. Uh, okay, so we are going to speak uh, about how basically our health is connected with the built environment, uh, what are the good approaches, where should we start, where should we look at, and of course, why is it important today. Uh, I have an honor to be a moderator. Our speaker, let me present our speakers. Uh, first of all, it's Angela Water, Vice President of Research and International Well-Building Institute. It's uh, Karen Lee, the author of Active Design Guidelines, uh, author of Fit Cities, and also a professor at the University of Albert. It's Helen Pinau, uh, teacher at uh, School of Sustainability and Health, uh, Environmental Health at Sh School Bartlett, and uh, Alexandra Chichotkina, Managing Director at Stel KKB. Uh, the first speaker today will be Angel Loder as the in at the International Well-Being Institute, Angel Loder is responsible for the direction and development of scientific research that supports the well-building standard, an international rating system for the certification of buildings. Please, Angela, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, let me just... If you can see my screen? Great. Yes. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different approach today to talk about active design in a city. And part of this is based on lessons learned and trends we're seeing with COVID-19, as well as case studies that I've experienced and um, lessons learned from some case studies recently in North America, um, and then looking at future directions. So my name is Dr. Angela Loder. I um, lead or help lead research at the International Well Building Institute. <clears throat> and let's just start at the city scale. This is a great, you know, discussion. The whole conference is around urban planning and great cities. Um, and we know that COVID-19 is changing the way the world perceives the link between health and the design of buildings and communities. We know that infectious disease in the past has actually been hugely influential in urban planning and building design. It led to transformative changes, including improved ventilation standards, access to nature and hygiene practices. And in fact, some have even argued that um, infectious disease helped create the field of modern health. We also know that chronic disease has influenced urban planning. Now, um, for example, we know that walkable neighborhoods or like this um, image here of great bike lanes really encourage movement and incre can increase the risk of chronic, um, chronic disease and obesity. We also have seen, unfortunately, that despite great effort, um, this has been arguably less effective at creating large-scale systematic change than infectious disease. For example, especially in North America, we are still building car-oriented cities, even though we know they're terrible for health and particularly terrible for getting us to move. And so COVID-19 is really challenging these um, divisions. Um, we have an opportunity to uh, showcase here the link between um, chronic and infectious disease, urban and building design, environmental health, and health equity. For example, we have evidence that those that live in areas with heavy air pollution, often from vehicle traffic, and those that have chronic disease, such as um, related to obesity, have a higher death rate from COVID-19. We've also seen in COVID-19 that parks are proving to be essential for mental and physical health of urbanites. Um, so nature is not new. 
right? We know that nature um, is good for our health. Um, there's been compelling evidence on the benefits of nature for city dwellers for at least 30, 40 years. Um, this has been shown both at a population level and at a, in smaller studies. Some of the key benefits here include faster recovery from stress, improved immune function, and move, improved mood, um, restoration of attention and ability to concentrate. And park specific research, which is most of the research around cities and nature, has shown increased socialization, community cohesion, physical activity, and health. Um, and this is really important as I'll show in some of the case studies because all green space is not created equal. Um, we've got cities that are struggling with both too much green space and not enough green space. So we've seen some cities that are the shrinking cities. This is a picture of Philadelphia, particularly bad example of green space in nature. Um, and uneven investment in communities have led to vacant lots, um, post-industrial relics, and struggling communities. And the evidence is that the, this type of nature that is um, so-called neglected simply does not give the kinds of benefits that most of the research shows um, gives benefits on nature. Um, and as we know that the economic and social context influences um, urban park and green space use. So it's not a case of just build it and they will come. And a lot of the new movements and trends that we're seeing is this recognition of who is this for? How do they get there? What is that social context to encourage people to be active and to get out in nature um, in the city? We've also seen on this flip side that cities are struggling with a lack of space to add green space and they really need to find creative solutions. And those are the types of case studies we're gonna be looking at today. So this is a quick presentation. Um, I'm just gonna look at um, some of the lessons learned on two quick case studies that were done to increase physical activity and access to nature, this kind of new type of urban greening, as well as giving um, a pointer to some upcoming research for future action. So um, my book came out, uh, Small Scale Urban Greening, Creating Places of Health, Creativity and Ecological Sustainability in March. And it really looked at four different types of urban greening, small scale urban greening. Today, I'm going to point out the results of two of the case studies on elevated and post-industrial green space. And those are the rail parks in Philadelphia and Chicago. And these rail parks are interesting because they're very innovative, creative ways of thinking about the quality of life in cities. Um, and they represent two of the four trends that I've seen. Um, tactical urbanism, sometimes called urban acupuncture, in which you do a small scale, sometimes temporary um, installation to try to test out what something might look like. This has been very successful with trying to encourage complete streets in North America um, and slowing down traffic. Um, and as well as linking, explicitly linking public health and urban green space in a really new way um, that I'll be talking about in just a minute. So Chicago and Philadelphia, um, they are both famous for their parks and their urban design. That's Philly in the top and Chicago in the bottom. They're both 100 Resilient Cities recipients. They've also both suffered from areas of um, disinvestment and disparity, and they both got really strong environmental initiatives. They both came out with their resilient plan quite recently. The 606 case study in Chicago, so the top one is obviously pre-shifts. Um, um, it was a disused elevated rail line um, and it connects four ethically and um, economically diverse, eth ethnically and economically diverse neighborhoods. Um, the result of, of 606 was, was the result of both bottom up activism like local artists and a nonprofit that managed it, Trust for Public Land and top down activism from the city of Chicago. And importantly here, the key goal for this um, project was to increase active transportation, such as um, walking or biking. And this was due to federal funding. So the results, this is a picture of um, one a section of the um, 606 trail, the 2.7 mile trail opened in 2015. It includes a lot of public art and four newly acquired upgraded or expanded parks that are adjacent to the trail um, to really help increase green space and um, landscape sections of it that are designed to feel like a series of rooms. By the end of the first year, they had over 1 million users on the west end of the trail and 2 million on the east end. And they averaged almost 4,000 users a day, up to 10,000 in really peak areas. And anecdotally, they're still doing research on this, but they have found some increases in the diversity of users. So users, for example, especially from the west end that are not typically physically active, that um, you know went out and bought their first exercise gear, suddenly felt that they had a safe space away from prying eyes in the street in which to be physically active that was accessible to everybody and there wasn't a pay barrier behind it. Um, Philadelphia Rail Park um, is a disused elevated rail line. It was in a so-called donut, so an area of, of lack of development um, in a developing neighborhood and they really wanted to develop, develop it to encourage um, a 
complete development of the area, um, also an ethnically and economically diverse neighborhood. This was also a result of both bottom-up activism from local artists and a nonprofit that ran it, um, and top-down activism from the city of Philadelphia. And the key goals here were slightly different. They were to increase green space. Um, that area is typically uh, was traditionally industrial. It did not have residential areas. Um, physical activity, and then green space and socialization space that was authentic and reflected the um, industrial past and was available to multiple use in multiple ages. So the first 1.4 mile spur opened in 2018, and it's really created a social and artistic space for locals to walk, relax, and be educated on local plants. It also reflects the local history and industrial past, um, and this really gives a safe green space and that kind of neighborly feel. In that neighborhood, they don't have that porch culture because they don't have, not traditionally, um, row houses, and is a safe space for locals of all ages to be um, and be active. Um, so some of the key takeaways um, from these two case studies is we really need to take into account the social aspects of physical activity and the links to the neighborhood. Um, urban green space can also be a path to investment and revitalization. I think it's particularly important as we look at you know, reinvesting in our cities post-COVID, hopefully at some point. Um, and that the role of social interaction and pride, neighborhood attachment are very important to help create links to inviting safe spaces for physical activity for all. Um, that rail line was a site of crime in Chicago and really had to do a lot of work to convince locals to use that space, particularly in the West End, which is a, um, it tended to be a rougher neighborhoods. So some of the synergies, we know there's synergies and trade-offs between densibility and livability. So we want people to be dense because it encourages easy transit and walkability. But we also know that tends to get rid of um, green spaces and open spaces, which can make it more livable and more inviting. Um, we know that nature, urban nature has known benefits, but how can we really creative about creating inviting spaces that people actually want to use and have a multiplicity of health benefits? They encourage physical activity, they can help reduce stress, they can provide open safe spaces, during this such as infectious uh, disease pandemics. And we really need to look at the city in innovative ways. What spaces do we have? What spaces can we use? Um, corridors are a great example of a way that often aligns with ecological corridors and habitat corridors as well. And they can really connect different districts, um, which is a great way to be able to access and create avenues for physical activity. And of course, we really need an integrated approach because without it, the best intentions fail. You can have the healthiest building in the world, but if you do not um, have access Access to great transportation and walkability, it's not going to, you're not going to encourage physical activity. So COVID-19 was also highlighting is green space is a public health issue. So COVID-19 is highlighting the need for urban green space. Um, and really what we're seeing in all of these case studies is the lack of high quality green space is being recognized as a public health risk and a citizen right. And this is really important for equity and for um, getting people outside safe, inclusive spaces. What kind of nature you add really matters. So what I want us to think about as a key takeaway here is what is our current opportunity with COVID-19 for health and urban design? And just to finish off here, I work for the International Wellbuilding Institute. We run a healthy building standard. We have 10 concepts, um, an integrated approach. Um, and we recognize that we can talk as much as we want, but if we don't bring different disciplines together and we don't recognize what existing and remaining gaps and opportunities we have, we're not going to be able to creatively solve these problems. So in Q1 of 2021, we're coming out with a global research agenda with 20 other global experts. It identifies 12 impact topics and key gaps and opportunities for translating research into practice and vice versa. It aligns with key um, in international standards. And it really also sets sector specific targets for priorities and implementation. And we're pleased to know that access to nature and movement and physical activity are key there. Um, so we hope that this really stimulates um, activity and research and creative innovative solutions to adding more green space and physical activity. Thank you. And my email is there. I will stop um, sharing to let Karen go. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, Great speech. Uh, actually, I have uh, one question for you. Uh, it's uh, connected with the situation that we're having now. You've mentioned active transportation, access to greenery and green spaces in the city. And uh, well, we hear a lot during lockdown the about collapse of uh, local economies, right? But we don't hear a lot about health issues. And basically, what we need to think now, it seems, that how can we bring back this activity? How can we bring back people to green spaces? And basically, have we done enough before the lockdown? 
unmute myself. Great question. I think um, parks, we've known that parks are great for cities for a long time. We've had the city beautiful movement. This is not new. However, it is often be considered a nice to have and not necessarily a essential to have. Um, and when it's tough budgetary cuts, parks don't get maintained. They become unsafe. They're not really creatively thinking about small scale urban parks. I mean, let's be honest, most of us, unless live in Detroit and other, some of the other cities, are not going to tear down the center part of business districts to create a new central park. We need to be creative about looking at those, um, those slivers, those corridors, those pocket parks that can create great um, spaces of access and encourage people to get out of their homes and encourage people to spend time outdoors, which especially in a time of infectious disease is really important. I think one of the key things is the, um, the issue of siloing. So when you've got the Parks and Rec Department here, Chicago is very exceptional. They've got um, great funding for Parks and Rec, so they've been able to consistently fund their Parks and Recreation. But most cities, um, the Health Department is not linked to the Parks and Rec Department. So some of the, we were on a session with the Salas Healthy City Design last night with some of our partners from Gell, and they were suggesting, which I thought was great, that you need to put the people in health who are looking at health outcomes and air quality, physical activity, we've done calculations on what that cost would be. They need to be put into the Finance Department. They need to be put in the Finance Department for cities and in, as well as organizations. And I think once we start making that calculation and, incur and incorporating it into city budgets, then we will start to see a little bit more but I do think that moving forward, we have a huge opportunity now to really rethink how we're using our city spaces and create this, these inclusive, diverse, and quite frankly, fascinating and encouraging and all the things you want for good nature spaces in our cities to make this huge public space and have um, you know, huge economic and social and uh, health benefits. Great, thank you. Uh, it's great that you've mentioned that there are different departments involved in that process, not only health department or construction department. And uh, now I'd like to go on further and invite Karen Lee to have her presentation. Uh, Karen, uh, well, Active Design Guidelines that you developed is a solution that provides architects, urban designers, urban planners with uh, guidance and strategies on how to create public healthy places that promote active active lifestyle, I would say. And please tell us more about it and the evidence that you have. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and where you can see that. Share. Um, and I'm going to put it in uh, full screen mode. Okay, can you see the screen? Can everyone see the screen? Okay. Perfect. All right. All right. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Lee. Um, I am an associate professor in the Division of Preventive Medicine, Department of Medicine, University of Alberta. So, I'm back in Canada now after about 12 years in New York City. And I think, as Gregory mentioned, when I was there, um, I was involved in the creation of the active design guidelines. Um, that, you know, from our um, monitoring of downloads has been, you know, downloaded and used by architects, urban planners, urban designers, who are target audiences um, in over 80 countries around the world. And we actually created a series of other supplements to the active design guidelines following the release of the guidelines in 2010. Uh, you could see one of them on the um, screen there called Active Design Shaping the Sidewalk Experience. We have an active design supplement on promoting safety. So all of these are available on my website that's shown, drkarenlee.com. Um, I was also asked, um, <clears throat> you know, um, by a, a publisher, Penguin Random House, to write about the process related to, uh, you know, all of these activities that were done in New York and after New York, I was also involved in consulting uh, for uh, a number of other cities around the world. So um, that's now captured in Fit Cities. So if people are interested in some of the processes and, you know, how we got them done, the partnerships that Angela also spoke about, uh, you can also read about it in Fit Cities. Um, you know, I only have about 10 minutes as with our other speakers. And so I'm just really going to touch on um, an introduction to, I think, what our health priorities are today, and also uh, some of the uh, evidence out there on solutions 
uh, for uh, addressing some of these issues. So um, to start with, I know we are living currently in the midst of a COVID-19 um, pandemic. And um, I think um, if you look at the leading causes of death outside the pandemic though, that are very relevant as Angela said to the pandemic, they are now non-communicable diseases. So diseases like heart disease and strokes, cancers, diabetes, chronic lung diseases, they're now the number one cause of death globally. 41 million deaths every year, counting for over 70% of our deaths. And they're largely preventable um, through leading risk factors like tobacco use, physical inactivity, unhealthy diets, uh, harmful use of alcohol, um, those in turn are linked to high blood pressure, overweight and obesity, high cholesterol. And then, you know, if you get cancer, cancer associated infections. Now, the issues that are highlighted in red, I wanted to talk a little bit more about today. Um, tobacco and harmful use of alcohol. Now, those are still very important in the global context, but there are also many jurisdictions that have um, undertaken initiatives like smoke free workplaces smoke-free public spaces, you know, um, zoning and other regulations that regulate, for example, alcohol. Uh, but I wanted to talk today about all the things that still can be done in our cities around the promotion of physical activity, healthy food and beverage access, and that can in turn affect these other issues like high blood pressure, overweight, obesity, high cholesterol. Um, these issues, as has been mentioned by Angela, are also um, really important. If you have these underlying conditions in the context of COVID, um, you are at risk for more severe infection and for mortality. So the rates of these diseases in our populations are actually very important in determining how bad COVID is also going to hit in our uh, populations and in our geographies. The other issue as well that I wanted to point out is uh, our mental health burdens. Um, you could see that depression, this is from um, a WHO uh, paper, our depression now significantly affects our global population as well, affecting about 350 million people or one in 20 people worldwide in an average year. It's now uh, the leading cause of disability worldwide. And you could see that effective community approaches include issues like and programs like exercise programs for the elderly. So we typically think issues like social isolation contribute to mental health is, uh, issues. But in fact, issues like physical activity actually have been shown also to be protective against mental health issues like depression and anxiety. I also want to point out, on the other hand, that the risk factor of social isolation and lack of social support not only affects mental health issues, but also the physical health issues that are now the leading causes of death. So for example, studies have shown that being socially isolated and lacking in social support can actually make you have poor outcomes for diabetes, high blood pressure, arthritis, lung disease. There are also studies that show that, you know, if you are socially isolated, you may be at increased risk for getting a first heart attack up to 50% higher. And so these risk factors such as physical inactivity and social isolation actually contribute concurrently to our mental health burdens as well as to our physical health burdens like chronic diseases. I also wanted to point out that another social factor that has become very prevalent in our world include um, work stress. So, um, and work stress, particularly low job control, if you don't properly reward high effort jobs uh, with uh, pay, recognition, status, that that can actually be associated with increased risk of both mental health issues and of excess coronary heart disease and chronic diseases. So, um, the other issue is uh, work insecurity. So having work that is insecure and precarious also impacts health. Now, what can we do about all of this? And what do cities have to do with it? Well, our cities are often, you know, city governments often are huge employers in their cities. Uh, we also have many businesses, um, you know, that can impact how we organize work. 
but how we design our cities are also really important. So for example, studies have shown, and these are not just one study, there are multiple studies that have been reviewed, that community design, having enough density to allow for residential areas to be close to stores, jobs, schools, recreation and green spaces, like Angela mentioned, connecting them um, by sidewalks and bike lanes, amenities that uh, don't require you to only use the car, aesthetic and uh, uh, safety appeals of those environments. And you can shape that by policies like zoning, building codes, government policies, and builders' practices. Those have been associated with increasing physical activity by over 160% but also decreasing social isolation, increasing people's sense of community. It can also lead to reduction in crime and stress. And so what I also wanna demonstrate here is when we actually move upstream to our health solutions, when we don't only rely on treating diseases once people get ill, but we move upstream to prevention and we think about communities and our environments, we can actually impact many of these risk factors all at once. So we could impact physical activity, we could impact social isolation altogether. Street designs complement community design. So for example, at the street scale, do you have good traffic calming approaches? Can you cross the street safely? Do you have street lighting for safety? Uh, how do you landscape those elements so that it's more pleasant to walk on those streets? Um, those the types of measures can actually increase physical activity. They're associated with increased physical activity of 35%. Again, associated with increased sense of community and decreasing isolation, reducing crime and stress. Building designs can also play a role. So having simple signage like this one that we did in New York, burn calories, not electricity, take the stairs. When you place signage like that at points of decision, so where you're um, outside of stairwells, uh, next to elevators and escalators, that can increase stair use by a median of 50%. You know, in very high rise buildings, you may not be able to, you know, uh, some people may not be able to walk 30 floors, for example, but you can reprogram elevators, all of them except one for people with disabilities, but all of the rest can be programmed to being express elevators that stop, stop only at every third or fourth floor. Studies shown have shown that you do that, you can increase physical activity by 3,300%. Aesthetic interventions like music and art that you put in stairwells. If you can see the stairs when you walk into a building, natural lighting is also associated with increased stair use. Uh, currently, Food one minute more. Okay. Sorry. Food environments are also really important. So, for example, if you have, studies are showing, if you have access to healthy food through uh, having supermarkets, for example, in your neighborhood, those types of neighborhoods have lower rates of obesity um, and better nutrition in adults and children. On the converse side, if you have a lot of unhealthy food like fast food restaurants, that's associated with increased weight and obesity and poor nutrition in area residents. You can also do things within food retail. For example, labeling calories or sodium on your menu because we know that when you have information right at the points when you're trying to make decision, those tend to be the most effective types of information for behavior change. Community gardens, emerging evidence that if you are exposed to gardening, both adults and children, people tend to eat more fruits and vegetables. Even access to tap water. You know, there's a study done in um, Germany in actually impoverished neighborhoods where they found that, you know, in, in the um, schools where they actually ensured that there was tap water to drink, coupled with some elementary education on that, that those schools had reduced risk of overweight in the children when they followed up with them a few years later compared to schools that didn't have those interventions. And then, of course, work sites, you know, where we spend much of our time. Um, you know, I know many of us are working from home these days, but... Uh, when we return to the work site, what are the things both socially in the organization of work and physical infrastructure that can be done to support people in the behavior changes and the supports that they need to make those behavior changes around physical activity and healthy eating and even social connections? 
Um, yeah, and then as I mentioned, there are more, if you're interested in more resources, uh, my website has a lot of the resources, including the active design guidelines and its supplements and the Fit Cities book uh, documents many of the, uh, of the uh, uh, processes. And I also teach a course uh, in June of each year at Columbia University offered to the Mailman School of Public Health. It's a two day course called Designing Healthy Cities. We include actually in the past course, we have gone to uh, the Well Building Institute to their building and to uh, take a look at um, how they've designed to well certifications as well. So thank you very much. Um, and um, I look forward to more discussion. Thank you, Karen. Um, thank you for a great presentation. I have a question for you. And well, you started with the uh, evidence and all basically everything that you said was based on evidence. And it's, well, it's, every, it's very convincing. But is health actually on the radar and uh, who realizes its importance and who should? Well, I think, you know, it can always start from uh, different ways. Uh, so, you know, in New York, when I was working there under Mayor Bloomberg's administration, we, uh, the health department uh, who I was working with uh, actually created a new position. So I was both the uh, deputy to the assistant commissioner for chronic disease prevention and control, but also the inaugural director for healthy built environments. And so in that role as healthy built environments director, uh, I would actually, um, it was part of my job to reach out to partners in other city departments, uh, like planning, transport, housing, uh, parks and recreation, um, school construction, um, but also uh, to private sector partners like developers, private sector design, architecture, planning firms. And um, together, we actually um, co-created things like the active design guidelines and brainstormed together, you know, what we could feasibly do in the city to advance these issues of creating healthier buildings, streets, and neighborhoods. Um, Gregory, I didn't have a chance, you know, in this short presentation to go into the case studies, but I do have some case studies in my next presentation for those who are able to join um, uh, the next presentation um, af after this one. Sure. Uh, yeah, and everyone welcome to join us in the next session with Karen Lee. And we're moving forward to Helen Pinel. She's a lecturer in sustainable and healthy built environments at the faculty of the built environment at the University College London. And she has developed a new approach on how basically we can look on impact of urban design and urban spaces on health called Thrive's framework towards healthy urbanism, inclusive, equitable, sustainable. Please, Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gregory. Can you just confirm if you can see my slides? Uh, we can see you at the moment. Yeah, okay. perfect. Great, thank you. So yes, my name is Helen Pinio, and uh, today I'm going to be introducing a new framework for healthy urbanism called Thrives. And I will also talk about some research we've been doing at the implementation of these principles for healthy urban design in projects around the world. And we've looked at a number of case studies. And so I will share a couple of those and what I think are some of the key lessons about building um, a business case for healthy urban design. Uh, as Karen and Angela have already highlighted, I would just re-emphasize that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to our attention and really highlighted um, the connections between health and ecosystems and urban policy. And we have seen within cities around the world that the way our cities are designed and maintained has influenced how well we can cope in the pandemic. And so some communities had greater access to um, spaces outside. Um, when they were in lockdown, they were still able to get outside and into nature. And some communities didn't have that. So it's really uh, emphasizing something that we've known for a long time, which is that the highest environmental burdens within cities are usually in low income and ethnic minority neighborhoods. And so there's lots of studies which have shown that people living in those neighborhoods have reduced access to the things that support health and they have increased exposure 
to, to the things in our urban environments that um, cause disease and illness and even death. And on the basis of this uh, information and, and building on a lot of uh, existing theory and evidence about uh, the built environment's impact on health, I've created the THRIVES framework. And that stands for Towards Healthy Urbanism, Inclusive, Equitable, Sustainable. And this is a new way of thinking about how can we shape the built environment to support health in cities? And so I've built on existing models, but I've really put planetary and ecosystem health at the center, where usually these models put humans at the center. And that's because I'm trying to really emphasize the importance of the impact of, uh, on our health of environmental degradation. And also I've put at the center these three core principles of um, inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. So that all decision-making within a city uh, for built environment, whether that be um, infrastructure or energy policies or specific building design measures, they should all consider these three core principles. Within this diagram, you see three different scales of health impact. And through those different mechanisms, the health of, of a particular city resident can be influenced, but also the decisions that we make in a city like London can influence the health of people in Moscow through um, the mechanisms of uh, the climate crisis and other environmental degradation. So we can see the importance of city decision-making at multiple scales. And I'll just talk through a little bit more what the Thrives framework means in terms of uh, how we work in urban design and planning. So the three key messages here in the orange boxes, I'll go through those, and the green boxes show a solution. So the first one is that health impacts often occur far away from new development, and that could be through something like the environmental mechanisms, but it, it could be also be uh, social impacts, so that um, if you exclude certain community groups from a development, that could uh, impact uh, neighboring communities. So we need to think beyond the boundaries of development. And by boundaries, I don't just mean the spatial boundaries, but I'm also thinking over time so that uh, we may find some impacts are very immediate and some take decades uh, to be seen. The second message is that there are structural barriers that are preventing healthy living for many people. And a lot of public health messaging has uh, over the years talked about healthy lifestyles and uh, healthy choices. And I'm trying to um, build on a number of scholars and practitioners who are pushing back against that messaging and saying that uh, people are prevented from making those healthy choices by uh, societal and structural barriers such as racism or income inequality. And so within the built environment, we need to target interventions and uh, design with an inclusive process with the communities and, and residents who will be affected. And finally, uh, the message is that environmental degradation is affecting health now in our, uh, in our cities and around the world. So we need to use uh, sustainable design principles for health. And these two areas have often been seen as uh, separate policy objectives in the built environment. So I'll just give a couple of uh, case study examples. And as I mentioned, this is from a research project we did interviews in uh, a number of countries around the world with um, built environment professionals who were working on healthy urban developments. And we also looked at existing guidance documents and, uh, and studies, and we synthesized the lessons across these case studies. This is the Bullet Center, which is a six-story office building in Seattle. And when it was built in around um, 2013, it was marked as the, one of the most sustainable buildings in the world. I just highlight some of the active design features that they used to promote uh, energy efficiency, but also for physical activity. So they designed the irresistible staircase and you can see the picture there. They used Douglas fir wood on the um, treads for the stairs, which gives a nice um, scent. And the stairs are also um, covered on, on two or three sides by windows um, looking out to the city. And so it's nice views. And they're also in a central location. And an evaluation of this found that 68% uh, of the trips from the main floor to the sixth floor were uh, taken via the stairs, which was higher than a typical office building. 
some of the other uh, provisions that they had for uh, bicycle storage and showers and um, no on-site parking, they felt uh, in the evaluation resulted in higher active commuting for people working in the Bullet Center than other Seattle office workers. And I think this development demonstrates the, the key messages about thinking beyond the boundaries of development by using the sustainable design principles um, for health. Another example from the UK is Barton Park, and this project is still being uh, developed and it's a mixed use, large scale development. There'll be around 885 new homes and uh, new open space but the developers are also contributing to funding for new and improved outdoor sports facilities, um, health and community hub uh, facilities that can be accessed by new and uh, existing residents. And they're supporting social prescribing. And that means that uh, the local um, general practitioners will prescribe things like dance classes or outdoor walking to uh, patients who are coming in with, um, for example, chronic diseases um, who they would benefit from that social activity and physical activity. And also uh, strategic transport provision was supported through this development. So I think they've embodied all three of the, the key messages that I mentioned previously. And some of the evaluations have shown these initial activities have been really well received by the community, and particularly the social prescribing um, has resulted in uh, cost savings for the local health service. This is just a, a quick overview of the case studies that are included in our research project. And we are drafting up um, a number of outputs to share this information because we've pulled together the findings from across these projects. Um, we were limited to looking at English language publications. And so it's not comprehensive international examples, but there are, um, there are examples from many different countries. I'm just going to pull out here what I think are some of the key findings for building a business case for healthy design. And this is um, through the interviews, we found people uh, really frequently described uh, a challenge of um, convincing developers and particularly private developers that they should invest upfront in healthier uh, design measures, which could be um, higher consultancy costs or specific materials that are more expensive. And so through different evaluations across these projects, we've drawn out some of the key financial benefits, um, including rent increases in the project in the Netherlands. They, um, for the first phase of the development, was sold on a 23% return. And they also received higher rents compared to other um, property in that area. And so there are a number of different benefits that are highlighted here, which are financial and can be directly received by the developer. But some of them are also uh, received by public utilities and services. And I liked what Angela was saying about having a health economist in a city department to help measure and bring into the city's budgeting what those benefits will mean so that we can encourage people to invest in, in features. And the Bullet Project there was an evaluation that looked at the public benefits of all of the infrastructure that they were uh, producing on site. So by producing energy, by processing their own rainwater and uh, sewage, they actually can save $18.45 million in, um, over a 250 year life cycle, which is a really significant saving for one building for the city. And, um, then we also pulled out health benefits from these projects. And uh, certainly health economists can turn these into financial figures, but many of these were about um, you know, increased physical activity from um, measures on the site, such as walking and cycling, and also residents reporting improved health or decreased use of emergency room services. And um, the final bullet point there shows the Barton Park Social Prescribing Program, um, which has resulted in uh, savings of nearly 80,000 pounds over two and a half years, um, which is fairly significant. So thank you very much for your time. I just want to highlight that uh, there's a website for further information where you can find links to the journal articles uh, where we've described the Thrives Framework, and we will continue to publish the case studies there. 
And I'll also note that I run a master's program at UCL called um, the Master's in Health, Wellbeing and Sustainable Buildings. And we have recruitment open for next year um, and the link is there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, well, you mentioned that your approach is connected to promoting health uh, and advocacy for health uh, in the environment. And I was wondering how can we, m we make this knowledge more accessible, what would be the ways, and how can we spread it wider? And I guess it may be connected with your, uh, with your working at the education. Yeah, I think there's a, a need for increased education across uh, multiple built environment professions, and that would include architecture and surveyors and planners, urban designers. They all need to incorporate much more about health within their core curriculum for undergraduate programs. I think that practitioners are now receiving a lot of um, good guidance documents and, and training is now becoming more and more available for current practitioners to upskill in this area. And we have some funding from the Bartlett to produce a, an open online training uh, course for professionals about the Thrives framework and um, sh using the case studies that I've uh, demonstrated here and also building on the, the huge range of evidence that also Angela and Karen uh, cited in, in their presentations. There's just a huge amount of evidence that tells us that we can act now to develop healthy uh, built environments. And I think uh, by using that kind of professional training, we can help people understand the range of skills that they will need across design, but also building the business case. Great, great, thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Alexandra Chichotkina, Managing Director at Strelka KB. And at Bureau, they deliver a lot of projects uh, in Russia, and they started realizing that health and sustainability are important, and that uh, and Alexander will share with us uh, what seems to be the most important, what are the challenges in Russia. Please, Alexandra, you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. And um, I'm happy to join this international discussion, and actually, that um, represent uh, our Russian experience, local experience um, in some way. I'll give my presentation in Russian language and prepared it in Russian, but then I will be happy to be back um, in English with our colleagues. Please tell me if the if the screen is on, if you can Fine. see my presentation. Thank you very much uh, and uh, good evening to all our participants. My name is Alexander Chichotkina. I will just switch off the translation. So my name is Alexander Chichotkina and I am the project director and uh, I deal a lot with the uh, projects of uh, uh, city districts uh, development in the Strelka KB. And as Grigori uh, has said, uh, lately we see these common trends uh, for territory development uh, and uh, issues related to uh, city territories linked to the following questions. What is a healthy city or a livable city? Because you know, in Russia, cities, and uh, first of all, um, I need to say that uh, cities in Russia continue to grow. The number of uh, city dwellers um, is uh, increasing. Uh, now, a huge percentage of uh, our population is living in cities. And practically 33% of people are living in big cities. And this is the aspect which gives the difference between us and other cities. But at the same time, we understand that according to a number of modern studies, 
key issues and reasons for chronic diseases of people in cities are epidemiological factors, so not genetic factors, but environmental factors and factors related to the lifestyle. So what is the lifestyle of a person? What does he or she eat? What are the environmental factors? How he or she can cope with the stress in the urban um, environment? And this is also one of the most important factors uh, to prevent some biological issues. So from the point of view of uh, uh, healthy cities, key challenges are in, in the sphere of biology, and now I would like to talk uh, more about this. Also, uh, they are in the sphere of unhealthy lifestyle, and it depends also on the uh, possibility to have a healthy lifestyle in a specific uh, urban environment. So the ecological issues influence uh, the lives of the majority of Russian population because uh, practically 70 percent of people are living in uh, cities uh, with uh, a polluted air, with uh, a polluted underground waters and uh, soil, and uh, uh, big industrial cities suffer from such issues. And we see the increase in influence of uh, environmental factors on population health. Life in cities and uh, employment can increase uh, the reduction of uh, physical activity and uh, the increase in stress, uh, etc. This is not a secret for big cities and for all people who are working in such spheres. So everything which is directly connected to the increase and uh, a popularity of such a lifestyle also will influence uh, on health issues. Also, we see that uh, urban uh, environment will increase the number of people uh, having physical activity up to 60 percent. And we see that people who could develop the economy and uh, lead a healthy lifestyle are suffering from chronic diseases, which could have been uh, prevented if we promote healthy solutions for our cities. And also, the vulnerability of cities uh, in front of uh, epidemics also depends on uh, density, and more than 70 percent of uh, uh, coronavirus incidents is happening in big cities, where not only the um, population density is high, but also where the where we have uh, overpopulation. And uh, we know that uh, um, issues with health will also lead to issues in economy. We will have an increase in uh, inefficient uh, public uh, expenditures, and uh, it uh, will be a vicious circle which will uh, negatively impact uh, the general health uh, situation. That's why we are talking about creation of healthy cities, which will enable us to face uh, such uh, environmental and economical issues. If we talk about uh, principles or ingredients for a healthy city, uh, we need to understand that uh, uh, space uh, solutions can integrate or modify some key elements and uh, these key elements are the following. So uh, these are cities uh, which enable people to uh, have a, a healthy lifestyle, cities with a comfortable uh, urban environment and accessible for all the social layers, uh, cities with uh, high quality and uh, comfortable housing, and uh, cities which are resilient to climate uh, crises. 
Today, taking into account uh, limited time for my presentation, I would like to highlight the questions of uh, ecological and uh, climate resilience. But before doing this, I will just highlight some other key elements. Uh, in Astralka KB, we are developing a lot of projects related to standards, and we are also developers of uh, the national standard of uh, complex uh, territory development, which uh, uh, suggests a number of solutions for urban space, and uh, we can use it uh, as a constructor uh, and it helps us to have the general image of uh, the environment which will enable people to choose between different different uh, scenarios of uh, lifestyle and uh, so we can choose among those uh, scenarios and uh, have the most suitable one on the one side, it can show us technological aspects of uh, space development, and on the other side, it uh, allows us to influence uh, the lifestyle of uh, people. A great number of projects uh, also include questions uh, related to mobility and uh, inclusion, also uh, projects related to the development of uh, uh, bicycle lanes uh, and we see the increase in importance of bicycles in our everyday life and also as um, an everyday means of uh, transportation and uh, also as a source of bicycle tourism. In Russia, we see a lot of developments in the sphere of comfort uh, cities, um, starting from uh, different norms and standards for comfortable spaces, uh, ending to uh, modern trends we see in mega cities, and also high quality and comfortable housing. Um, in this sphere, we have new solutions to achieve the highest possible level of quality of um, housing and of uh, uh, flats layout and if we talk about uh, climate and uh, ecological resilience we need to say that uh, modern cities should be able to optimize resources they have they need to take care of ecology and environment they need to take measures to uh, increase their ecological resilience and to reduce the charge uh, of an anthropogenic factors because these re risks are rising now and uh, finally it will also uh, influence uh, the state and the health of people. And uh, last point, uh, this is uh, the consequences of uh, global climate uh, change uh, on Moscow. We know that uh, we have uh, air pollution and the pollution of uh, waters and uh, the number of uh, precipitations also increase. We need to uh, increase the expenditures to um, cope with this. Uh, for example, it was uh, practically 1 billion rubles in uh, uh, 2019. And uh, our system cannot uh, cope with uh, this great number of uh, um, rain waters. 633 million cubic meters is the whole volume of uh, rain waters, and practically uh, 270 million cubic meters. It is a non organized uh, uh, volume of uh, rain waters which go just uh, to the Moscow River, and uh, uh, only 7% of uh, all these uh, uh, volumes are purified. Uh, according to all the standards. So we understand that uh, um, the majority of uh, these uh, rain waters are not uh, purified, are not treated. That's why it is an issue for public health in this city. But uh, uh, modern infrastructure can help us to face this challenge. And for example, 
we can uh, prevent uh, the fact that this water is uh, goes to the street actually and also this infrastructure can be self-resilient, multifunctional, more accessible uh, because it will be energy efficient and also it will enable us to uh, reduce costs. Such green infrastructure will really reduce costs for uh, treating rainwaters. And, uh, uh, we are talking about bio-drainage bio or other technologies which are quite easy to organize in open spaces to have this uh, effect in our city. And uh, uh, if we're talking about some additional solutions, we can create bio-drainage parkings. Such typological solutions can be found in new standards and in a number of guidelines. Um, you can find the links in presentations of my colleagues. And these are the solutions we can use today to cope with these challenges. The effect uh, from such green infrastructure is considerable because from the one hand, it will um, help us to cope with the CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases because um, today we have uh, a considerable volume of greenhouse gases uh, there uh, where we don't want to have them. We also can take out uh, um, dust particles. We can mitigate uh, um, the issues related to a temperature. It is uh, very important for Moscow, for sure. And also the adaptation to such uh, climate changes. It is not just a long chain of uh, events. It also gives us new possibilities. It helps the economy. It reduces our capital expenditures uh, on infrastructure. It reduces consumption. It helps us to distribute in a more correct way uh, the uh, treatment of uh, um, rainwaters. We can restore our uh, underground waters. And also, which is the most important, we can improve the uh, quality of life of uh, city dwellers, of people. We can improve their uh, health because they will live uh, in uh, a pure not polluted uh, spaces and uh, they won't face uh, any negative uh, consequences because, uh, you know, uh, in megacities there are quite a lot of issues related to healthy lifestyle and also uh, architectural and uh, uh, planning layouts uh, also can influence uh, the city dwellers' lifestyle. That's why we see that this is a complex uh, a series of uh, factors which should be taken into account by urban planners and all the uh, stakeholders. Thank you very much for your attention. I uh, will be glad to discuss it further. Seconds or minutes left. So I have the last question to all of you and I will ask you to be as brief as possible. You've mentioned different approaches, tools, or points of view on how can health be included in built environment, how can we change cities, and basically my question will be, what would be these professionals, how can these projects can be de developed on land when certain officials or certain local authorities, they don't have all that expertise, how can they move to, towards healthier cities? Well, thank you very much for your question. I think that that's a question which uh, actually would lay in any sphere. It's about uh, multi, being multidisciplinary. Um, it's not a case when uh, one architect who is responsible for a space in the city can, um, can provide all the solutions which will also be sustainable and uh, green friendly and uh, taking nature as a stakeholder in a project. It's about bringing into your project uh, uh, specialists 
ecologists and uh, experts in these disciplines who would help to, um, to actually um, set the new quality uh, for the solutions that you provide. So I, I believe in multidisciplinary teams um, and probably the challenges of our cities, they really start to tell us that it's quite important um, to hear our colleagues from the disciplines which, uh, which can add value uh, to the spatial um, practices that we are developing through our guidelines and through other documents. Thank you. Angela, Karen, Helen, do you have anything to add to? Um, I was going to say that, you know, I think one of the ways that when, when I was in New York and that we're actually going to start now in Canada as well, that uh, we use to bring together um, uh, different uh, professions to share their expertise was through our Fit City conferences um, that we had annually in, uh, in New York. And it's still going on, I believe. Um, you know, we are going to, in Canada, start this and on February 24th. It's going to be a virtual conference, so if folks here want to join as well. Um, on February 24th, we are going to have a uh, Fit Cities, Fit Towns conference. Uh, it'll be done virtually this year. Um, but that, you know, we've done these conferences before and I've helped other cities like I, we've done one actually in London quite a while ago in 2012 I believe um, in in conjunction with uh, city officials there um, you know we've done it in various U.S. cities like Miami Boston um, you know and and what the Fit City conferences can do or Fit City Spit Towns um, is uh, it can bring together these different groups with different expertise, you know, the planners, the architects, the developers, the city officials from different departments, uh, people from health, um, and academic sectors that do research in all of these areas. Um, and you could have a, a joint discussion, you know, and people can also meet each other and start to find networks of folks that they can partner and work with within their cities. So, um, I just wanted to, uh, to comment and add that. I would say quickly that um, the city of Philadelphia, this has been an ongoing issue to get different departments to talk to each other. The city of Philadelphia has had a really interesting model that seemed to be surprisingly effective, and this is with not very much uh, income. They had cabinet level appointees, and this was on sustainability and resilience. Um, and when they, and they also used sort of the Clean Water Act, which they negotiated with EPA to be able to get, um, to deal with stormwater on site. But what they did is that every time there was any kind of construction, road, um, you know, redo, um, neighborhood development, they would have all the different people from different um, departments and decision makers, not just like a lower representative, but decision makers saying, is this an opportunity for us to create a green urban green space there? Is this an opportunity for us to address also address stormwater on site? And by doing that, they're able to shift money between departments. They're able to actually do a huge amount um, with their um, with very few resources um, and it really helped to reduce that siloing. I mean, when I was interviewing some of these officials for the book, I was quite amazed. I've been doing urban planning stuff for a long time and siloing is one of the biggest issues that, that just the accounting for this intervention doesn't match up because the benefits are spread across lots of different uh, departments, but that seems to be in a very effective way. Um, and they've done amazing things with really, I mean, they've got a, a very high level of poverty in some areas, so their budget isn't high, but um, they've been quite successful. Thank you, Angela. Helen, do you have anything to add up or can I wrap up? Uh, uh, well, I would just say that I think uh, what everyone else has suggested is right and the importance of networking is huge. I think that there's so much existing guidance and there is a temptation because this is a new area for some built environment professionals to kind of reinvent things because uh, they weren't taught about it in their uh, core education and they may not know the right people who can point them to the existing resources. So I think um, having a city support for some key conferences and regular events for public health and built environment professionals to interact and uh, share resources would be a really great idea in areas where this is still emerging. I mean, some cities have like New York uh, already built that strong practice and some cities probably need to start those networks and move them forward. 
Thank you, thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you, all of you. It was a great pleasure to moderate you. I guess, just to summarize, we can see that there is no simple solution, but at the same time, we have enough evidence to start uh, striving towards healthier, better cities, and we have a lot of work to do. Thank you, Good and goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.